Now, I want to discuss about bi biomechanics. So biomechanics is studying the structure and function of biological systems using principles from mechanics. So just imagine this is a part of uh, a femoral bone of your leg, big thigh. And we want to replace uh, this with uh, prosthetic prosthetics. So some patients who had a problem in this um, joint, so we could have these uh, artificial hip joint. So to, to develop this uh, prosthetic hip, uh, we need to understand the strength of these biomaterials in mechanical point of view. And what we need is to understand kinematics and kinetics applied to human gait. Gait is a manner of walking. And we want to design mechanical replacements for hips, joints, heart valves, and various organs which uh, is performing mechanical function. So first, mechanics. What is mechanics? It's a branch of applied mathematics studying motion and forces that produces motion. And here I, I mentioned kinematics. And kinematics is the motion of bodies and systems without consideration of the forces. So only the geometric uh, relations are important in kinematics. On the other hand, we also need to understand uh, kinetics, or we call it as a dynamics. So that dynamics now we start to consider the forces, the so relation between external forces and their effect on motion. Of course, this derives from the famous Newton's law of motion. Just to note to you that uh, in chemi chemi chemistry, uh, chemical kinetics, uh, that kinetics actually means the rate of chemical reaction in chemistry. So to model, you know, to design this artificial joint that replaces a human hip, what would be necessary? So design of prosthetic hips, we use mathematical models of hip mechanics to predict the stress and strain that these artificial hip must endure. So that mechanical cons consideration is very important. And also you can see in B that this hip joint, which is a ball and socket joint, and there, there are considerations. So a metal hip implant with polyethylene cup to lubricate. It's not only mechanical, but the also uh, lubrication has to be under consideration. So this x-ray images uh, shows what is going on after this replacement. So, when we talk about mechanics, we can consider maybe big scale. However, our body down to the tissue and cell and even inside subcellular organelle, and that molecular level, there are forces and motions involved. So even when we talk about biomechanics, that can get down to the cellular level too. So here I brought some examples of biomechanical assays used to probe cellular properties. So even we want to know the mechanical properties of the cell and that complicated interaction with the environment is, can be very important in some situations. So for example, mechanical functions of cells such as cell motility. So we know that uh, when there are um, outside inserts such as bacterial attack or viral infection, our immune cells are very, very motile. This motility could be very important for our immune function. Also, another example is a cancer cell. So if cancer cells grow in one site in a primary position, it may not be that uh, life-threatening. The problem of much of cancer death is from so-called cancer metastasis, which requires a cancer cell 
to grow, becoming invasive, and crawl out of its initial position to move to distant place where they explode, which become very difficult to treat. So for this process requires cancer cell to move, and that involves a mechanical function. Another example of biomechanics is biofluid mechanics of cardiovascular and respiratory system. So in a, some way, our body, especially cardiovascular or respiratory function, is very, very much mechanical too. At the same time, <clears throat> we also consider in biological tissues the heat and mass transfer. So let's go back to the basics of biomechanics. I mentioned previously <clears throat> to design this to, to have a function which will last for years. We need to understand the basic stress and strain. So stress is uh, defined as a force per unit area. So for example, in a, in a compression mode or tensile mode, <clears throat> we can compute stress by force per unit area. At the same time, all these biomaterials can <clears throat> have a stretch or compression and that will deform. So to define this relative deformation, we can make a definition of measure of deformation, which is relative displacement. So strain is defined as the, the amount of change So <clears throat> strain <clears throat> is when there is a uh, force, let's say extent, then <clears throat> the amount of displacement divided by its original length so that it can be normalized in relative displacement. In this interesting chart, uh, you can see <clears throat> how we can prove a cellular mechanical property. For example, we can use atomic force microscope to to use a cantilever to measure very fine nanometer accuracy to poke, to, to poke on uh, the cell surface with a functionalized probe to see, to take it away or push to measure the cellular mechanical property near the cell surface. Similarly, we can use magnetic bead to code to attach on a cell and this magnetic bead, you can use external magnetic Fear to twist, and then how the cellular um, <clears throat> mechanical response to be measured, and also cyto indentation, which is cyto means cell indent is you are poking the cell, <laughs> and then you can measure the cell's mechanical property. Another fancy way is the so-called laser or optical tweezers, which requires a laser light to focus down and through a silica bead and this uh, optical intensity gradient uh, you can grab a silica bead which uh, is attached to for example red blood cell you can stretch the red blood cell with a defined force and then measure the displacement which gives the mechanical uh, property of the red blood cell or e you can see this microplate stretcher which attach the cell on the other side, and then you can exert a defined force and you can measure the displacement. And F, uh, this is using a microfabricated post array detector. So you can see the cells are sitting on top of this pillar post, which we know exactly the mechanical property. So this is a pattern surface and you can see from the top view, when the cells move or spread, they exert forces their bottom, which is these posts, and you can see the posts movement and displacement uh, from the wide field of view, then you can compute which part of the cell uh, bottoms are actually extending or contracting, and you can even compute the amount of force exerted because you know the mechanical property of these uh, posts, microfabricated posts. 
And in G, you may have seen something like this in in vitro fertilization, a movie. So this is called micropipette aspiration. And this is a cell and you can have a tiny micropipette. Let's assume that you can suck it. Then if you have, you know how much of pressure of suction force and you can measure the displacement of cell membrane to be inserted, then you could compute how well the mechanical the cell stretching property. And H, you can see on top of a substrate, the cell, or you can see shear flow. And this may be very important for studying uh, endothelial cells, which is a lining cells inside our blood vessel, because blood, there's always a flow and the, the property of the flow and these endothelial cells interactions very important in some disease such as atherosclerosis. And finally, this substrate structure is, you can use the substrate as a soft membrane and you can label focal adhesion complex, which is like a food process of a cell and you can label it in this case with a blue and you can use imaging when the, how the cell exert forces to the soft membrane to compute and understand the cell's force on its substrate. This is a reference, but we will talk about heart. So I want to show you the heart movement. So this is the uh, human heart animation, very realistic from Wikipedia. And this heart, uh, you can see this is the left part from what we see, but however, this is right side of that. So what you are seeing is like humans facing on you. So this is right ventricle, this is left ventricle, and on top, this floppy part is right atrium, and this is left atrium. So <clears throat> most of you probably know, but in a quick summary, so our body, the used body, which uh, consumes oxygen and nutrients, will come into right atrium via superior or uh, inferior vena cava, and that blood will pass through this uh, valve into the right ventricle. This is deoxygenated, so it has to go to the lungs to fill with, with the new fresh oxygen and exchange it to CO2 content. So it has to go to lungs, sorry, uh, to the, it's called pulmonary artery, because pulmonary means lungs. So the important thing is from the heart, when the blood comes from the heart to outside, we name it as an artery, while this is deoxygenated blood. So you can go to a right side of the lung, left side of the lung. And once it replenishes with a new oxygen, then it can come back to the heart through the pulmonary vein, and it goes to left atrium. And through this valve, it goes to left ventricle. You can see left ventricle has the biggest and thickest wall, which means it is the pump in our body. So through that pump of left ventricle, it goes pushing the blood throughout the body. So you can see this aorta. An aortic arch allows the blood goes to upper body and down throughout the body down. So you can watch this and you can notice the sequence of the valve opening because of this flow and direction. Now I want to talk a little more about the disease aspects of the heart. That valve can become diseased and problem for some people. So this is, is an example of a valve replacement. So this is called artificial heart valve. And um, this is coming from this article. So the A is the first animal implant. So throughout the medical history, the suffering person with a heart valve problem, we may, he or she may need a new heart valve. So our human, especially Albert Starr, started animal implant trial. So he developed this 
by leaflet. You can see these two leaflets felt with a Dacron single layer sewing ring so that you can suture into the existing heart. And he actually put it into an uh, implant in a dog two days after there was a problem in the dog, uh, dog's heart. So he took out his heart and examined what happened. So this is left atrial view of thrombotic occlusion. And I have to explain you what is thrombotic occlusion. And here is a thrombosis, means a blood clot formed in here. You can see some of the dark ones over here. And that clot occludes, uh, blocks this valve so that the function of the heart will be uh, compromised. So he come up with, since then, humans come up with a various ways of a better design. One of the design of this artificial heart valve is called cage bore mechanical valve. You can even understand from here, this bore, when the flow goes from down this direction, the bore is displaced and flow can go. But in the other direction, when the flow try to go back, this bore will block. So function as a valve. A valve. So this restraining cage, occluder bore, and suture ring serves as a, a kind of mechanical valve. There's also even another kind, is by leaflet tilting disc, mechanical heart valve. This may make a sound, but in general, these heart valves can last years nowadays. So we have developed this artificial heart uh, quite much. Regarding to this blood clot, I want to explain you about uh, this phenomenon of uh, blood clotting. So a medical condition, if someone has a surgery and lying down in, in a uh, patient bed for a very long time, or some people who have to sit down for hours and hours through a long distance travel, uh, he or she may get in trouble if the blood, if the blood doesn't flow, it is likely to uh, clot. So that is a problem. You can see a deep veins of the leg. Uh, there, the veins uh, do not have a lot of pressure difference to force the blood to push. Because of that, the veins usually have this valve, which allows uh, the direction of blood flow only one direction. However, if this is compressed and not moved for a long time, uh, there's a potential that the blood will clot uh, in that location. That blood clotting formed in situ. In situ means in its original place. So a local blood clot form is called a thrombus. So the same plural form is thrombi. So this I becomes US, a thrombus is called this. And this formation at the deep vein is called deep vein thrombosis. And by itself can affect uh, the patient's leg uh, uncomfortable. However, what matters further is when this clot is detached and getting into the circulation in your bloodstream. And that become a bigger problem. And this we call as an embolism. So this embolus is a, and plural is emboli, and this is called traveling clot, or even air bubble can form as an embolus, which is a traveling clot. And this has been carried in the bloodstream, and later on it lodged in a vessel in somewhere in our body, very likely into our lungs, or sometimes it can lodge into the brain. And so the combination of this thrombosis and its main complication and a local inside to blood clot thrombus can travel and that become an embolus. And this complication is called embolism and this can happen together and we call it as a thromboembolism. So to prevent this condition, uh, let's say if the patient cannot move on a bed, so we create uh, this device 
it's called sequential compression divide. So sequentially compressing the, the affected part. For example, in this case, a leg with a pump can prevent this deep vein thrombosis from happening. So now I discuss physiological modeling and biomechanics. So next time, I will in introduce bioinstrumentation.